when I had to close my eyes, I realized that the real reason why I'm here are two really young boys who finally get to sleep. So I always <laughs> don't sleep. No, uh, I was going to start with a little social experiment, but I'll actually skip that because we just had a little social experiment, how one person can actually move a room with just asking a question. So let me skip that and go straight into the presentation. Uh, my story is about 45 minutes long, and I have about 45 minutes. And once I start talking, I start talking. So uh, what I'll try to do is squeeze the presentation a little bit. So at the end, there's actually some time for questions because often people have questions. And I do want to give that space a little bit to see if I can actually answer those. So let me start with, uh, with something. of the story we take. You just saw this in this little poem. Backwards is something completely different than forwards. And that's really what I want to land with this presentation. And it's about the way you tell your story. So let me start with this one thing. System change, not climate change. So let me ask a question to everybody here in the crowd. Who in the last year started, uh, stopped eating meat or uh, eats less meat just because of the climate crisis? Who of you all here flies less or stops flying because of the climate crisis? Who of you gets sometimes told that you're a hypocrite for not being perfect, but asking the question? Yes, we all have that. Another question, who of you got frustrated during that thing where we're not supposed to talk about, that little thing between two things? Actually, my brain went somewhere else. Um, but who of you got frustrated because fl uh, empty planes were flying around the globe because airlines needed to keep their slots. Bit the same question with eating meat. Like more, there's more and more vegetarians or vegan people in the world, but yet the meat industry produces more meat than ever. So this story, really what I want to let as well, is about that big question, individual change versus climate change. If you know that about 100 companies in the world are responsible for 70% of the CO2 emissions in the world. What does it make you feel like? Do we then, as individuals, need to change in the sum of us all together? Is the, is the change we need? Or do we, individuals, need to change and by that create a movement? And that movement really creates that change. So am I here going to answer the question? Because I see some people already like move a bit to the front. like. Please answer that question. Do I individually need to change or do I need to vote all those things? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a psychologist, although some of my friends would argue that a little bit. Um, I'm a marketer. I'm a, a storyteller as a job, and I do that for a company. Who of you knows Patagonia? That's good news. <laughs> That means I do my job well, or actually our owner uh, keeps being bold in the software. <laughs> I'll try to claim it though. Uh, so I'm a storyteller, and it's about the, the way we tell the stories and how we, how we change the world. And I, will, I, I would like to land that really and take you all on a journey for how sometimes an individual or a small group can really create that change. So we all can be that one person. Um, so let me start with this photo. The guy in the middle with the S, that's the guy we all seen in the news last week, that's Yvonne Chonar. He's the founder of Patagonia, the brand I get to work for. And my role at Patagonia is telling those stories. I run brands uh, at Patagonia, that means for Europe, I get to build the environmental campaigns, the brand campaigns, and the product campaigns. And for us, even product campaigns are what you would say, an environmental campaign, because it's about the impact that product has. But let me start where the story really starts. And that is at this tin shed. But before I do that, and I go deeper into the story, let me just say how 
humbled I am to stand here and to open up. I want to thank the SAC people that this actually works because often the first presentation doesn't work. <laughs> and like, oh, my video doesn't work, so thanks for that. And um, I'm really humbled to be the first speaker because there's so many amazing speakers these next two days uh, where I can't even stand in the shadow of. But thank God. I work for Patagonia, so I can tell the Patagonia story. <laughs> so this is a photo from the early 60s, and what you see here is a, is a group of people, real California counterculture rebels. Just a group of surfers and climbers. They might have ended up changing the world or changing things in the world, but they were not out to do that. What they were out to do is just create, pro build product so they could go out to surf and climb. That's all they wanted to do, surf and climb, not save the world. And in the 70s, these photos are from the 70s, Yvonne, the guy on the left, is by the way also the guy on the right, um, he, he was making pitons. And pitons are little iron things which you hit in a wall while you're climbing. And he was building those, and he was selling them for a year, uh, for, for a dollar, of course it is in the US, a dollar a pop. And that money he made, he, he, could, uh, he could basically employ his friends and they could feed their families from those pitons they made. And they could go out climbing and surfing and go on big trips. But then after a trip he made to Scotland, he realized that what he was doing was not the right thing. Because every time you hit one of those things in the wall, it leaves a hole. So the next time you want to climb there, a bigger one needs to be hit in the wall. And what does that do to the future generation? It basically doesn't give them the opportunity to climb the same wall. So he realized he needed to change his business. And by that time, it wasn't a huge business, but it was a proper business. Families were feeding off it. But he knew he needed to change his business all around. So in 1972, he dropped what is known as the clean climbing essay, which made overnight change his business completely from making people to hit in the wall to the photo on the right where you see climbing equipment which you hang in cracks so you can still climb. And all his friends said, don't do it. This is bad for business. And he said, I don't care about business. This is the right thing to do, so I'm doing it. And that really is the basis of what Patagonia is founded on. Doing the right thing. Doing what's right. And this one person did that. And that's Yvonne. So what sort of brand are we? Let me start with that maybe a little bit, because most of you know it. Most of you know it from the news, or where the products, or do stuff. But what sort of brand are we? Well, we make products for harsh conditions, and for what we call silent sports. And silent sports, climbing, surfing, skiing, snowboarding, fly fishing, trail running. For some, it's walking the dog. Like, that's what we make products for. And at a certain point, the company grew. I'm in the 90s now, 20 years fast forward. And uh, Patagonia opened a store in Boston. At that time, the, the, the company grew quite big already. Uh, we opened the store in Chamonix already. No, I'm not that old, so I didn't pick the brand. Um, and the store in, in Boston opened. But when it opened, a lot of people in, who were employed in the store got ill. So, Yvonne started asking the question of like, why do people get ill? So they got an expert in, and an expert looked at the, uh, at the building and what was happening. And what ended up happening is that the circulation system in the building was broken. It took the air of the basement, put it back in the building, and circulated it back in the basement, and that circulated. But then the question Yvonne asked, like, but that doesn't mean people get ill, right, if air just circulates. And then the answer was, no, that the chemicals in the product used were circulating through the building, and that was making people ill. This was early 90s, and that's the time Yvonne realized he needed to do the right thing. He needed to go to organic cotton. But at that time, there was hardly a supply chain for organic cotton. His friends again told him he would run out of business. A, a, a normal, not normal, a chemical cotton t-shirt would cost $20, an organic t-shirt would cost $30. His friends say, don't do it. Your, your business, you will run out of business. He did it anyway. All his employees say, we can't do this. We shouldn't do this. So what he did is put all his product people on a bus, drove to a chemical cotton field, 
And the moment the employees saw those chemical cotton fields, they realized they had to change. So within four years, the company, and at that time there was no supply chain available for this and it couldn't scale yet. Within four years, the company really got behind it. And in 96, in, in 96 the company was fully organic cotton. And ever since, we've never made a chemical cotton product again. <coughs> Then let me go to the next story, and I will just jump from story to story to, to explain to you a little bit how the thinking of one person, or sometime a group, can really create change. Anybody knows this way? Anybody surf here? No idea what this wave is? It's called Sea Street. This is actually Ventura, the office of Patagonia is a little bit there in the right hand corner. Uh, and this is really the reason why why Yvonne and his friends moved to Ventura. This wave, if it's on fire, it's on fire. It's a really nice right-hander. And those guys would climb, they would surf a lot. And at a certain point, um, the local government, the local council of Ventura, um, called a town hall meeting to declare the Ventura River dead. That river, not a lot was happening in that river anymore. Developers. I don't even understand why we call it development, but I'm not a mother tongue English. Um, but developers wanted to close the river down, start building stuff on it. So they went to that meeting. They didn't go there to protect the river. They went there because this wave is created by the settlement of that river. And they wanted to make sure they could keep surfing. So they didn't go there to protect the planet or anything. They just wanted to surf. But what they found out was something completely different than they expected. Because that meeting was almost just a formality of declaring that river dead, but then this one student stood up. And this one student started showing photos of wildlife on the river banks, like small animals which were still alive there, the fish, the fish which were left there, the insects and the butterflies flying around the river. And that's the moment when that meeting completely turned around, because that river wasn't dead. That river needed to be restored. And that moment is really the moment where 1% for the planet was born. Because, Patag uh, because Patagonia and Yvonne gave that guy a desk in the office, gave him a big bag of money, and he started restoring and fighting for that river. And that's the basis of thinking grassroots activism really works. And that's what you currently see. We donate 1% of the sales um, we have globally to environmental causes. We call that our earth tax. Patagonia co-founded, uh, Yvonne co-founded 1% uh, for the Planet, and by now, thousands of brands are 1% for the Planet, and thousands of brands support all these small grassroots organizations which create that change around the world. I keep pointing that way, or I actually keep pointing that way. <laughs> then another interesting story. In the 90s, we also got a mission statement. Our reason for being was we built the best product, we caused no unnecessary harm, and we used the business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. This was for a marketer a great mission statement. Because if you would build a story, you could hang it on those pillars, and if, if it wouldn't hang it on, stand on top of those, it wouldn't make sense for the brand. So I loved it. But then in 2018, overnight, Yvonne decided to change the mission statement. Because he said, we got too comfortable in this mission statement. What does causing those unnecessary, unnecessary harm really mean? After, after about 30 years in this mission statement, we got too comfortable. So he, he changed it overnight, actually on a radio station. <laughs> and we woke up in the morning, and we had an emission statement. So of course, the town was set up so we could discuss these sort of things. And uh, the first question asked to Yvonne was like, so what does this mean? And his answer was, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and that really, again, is the basis of the brand we are, because we figured it out, and we figured it out. Because the reality is, not only Patagonia has to, we all have to. We are in an ecological and climate crisis right now. Scientists all over the world say we have about eight years left till we really hit those tipping points. And we are the first generation who really feels the effects of climate change. We see it. We saw it this summer already. 
You see it everywhere around. But we are also really the last generation that can really do something about it. So it's not only us as a brand, it's all of us who need to do something about it. So let me go back to that 1% for the, for the planet story again. So we donate 1% of our sales to these small environmental groups. And then in 2000, now I need to know the dates right, 2016, uh, at a day called Black Friday. We probably all know Black Friday. This is the big shopping frenzy. This is where a lot of brands try to dump their products for low prices and all trigger us into buying stuff we don't need. This has been a day for us. Like in 2011, we dropped an advertisement which was called Don't Buy This Jacket. Pretty sure for everybody who raised their finger, uh, which is almost everybody knows that, so let me not go deep into that. But in 2016, a junior designer in the office came up with the idea, why don't we give 100% for the planet that day? This was a junior designer, and very soon, within 10 minutes, that story made it all the way up to Yvonne and back to the junior designer and say, let's do this. So we built a campaign in about a week, and we gave 100% uh, percent to the planet that one day. Normally we do about give and take two million on a day globally in our own and operated stores and retail sales. That day we did 10 million. So did he don't care? He didn't care. He loved the fact that we gave 10 million away to different em environmental organizations. That also meant that in 2017, we doubled the amount of money we could give to these different environmental organizations in just one day. And that really shows that this one junior designer changed things. And he changed the way we work with different projects or different things. And again, this one person made that change in the organization. It's not all this one owner who does this. We are really encouraged to do those things we gave 100 million away to the Black, oh, 100 million. We gave 10 million away to these different organizations on Black Friday. And that really started the thinking of what did we really do and why did all these people all of a sudden buy our product? And what we realized is what we did is we gave people the opportunity to do something about the environmental crisis. By buying a product, they would support all these different organizations and groups. So we gave them the opportunity to do that, to do something. So what we soon realized is like, what if we take the product away from that? What if we don't ask people to buy our product, but instead directly connect our community to these environmental organizations? And that really was the starting point for what we call Pedagogy Action Week. This is a platform where you can find all the NGOs we support, like Service Against Sewage, not too far down the road here, and they can post and ask for skilled labor. So you can go on there and offer skill labor if, if you do, you can do something which these NGOs need. They can uh, put their petitions on there. They can ask for donations on there. They can put their events on there. And we really bring our community together with these different environmental organizations. Then two other little stories I will uh, I will talk about, which 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 is really show sort of the brand we are, and sometimes are pretty frustrating for working for Patagonia. The right one. Uh, in 2020, um, a small organization, which was called Stop Hate for Profit, asked us to join their uh, campaign. The campaign was focused on not advertising on Facebook for the, for the month of July. And the company we are, we have been having loads of conversations already, like how did we feel about advertising on Facebook to start with? Facebook is a platform which is profiting and capitalizing hate speech. We all know that. So how do we feel that we actually talk to our community and we pay money to an organization that's, that's basically enabling and capitalizing on hate speech? So it was very easy for us to jump on board. Brands like the North Face were already on board that time, and we joined in July. Now, tw two years later, we have still not advertised on Facebook, because for us, this was the starting point for looking ahead. And why that sometimes is frustrating for me as a marketer because Facebook was such a great platform to reach your communities. So it was sort of like, you know, we got this figure, can go on to the next thing, but uh -uh, that's not how things work at Patagonia. So we really had to reinvent the wheel. And two years later, 
we have reinvented that. And we talked to loads of other organizations, like Lush is a really great example who don't advertise on Facebook. And we try to partner with them to see if we can also create policy change with other social media platforms. The other one here is something uh, we often get asked or told, like, this is the best marketing campaign you guys ever did. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, but I have nothing to do with it. Um, and this story really shows why and the brand we are. Because we don't have a CSR department. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know, CSR departments are often at brands that one department or that one individual who's fighting the big fight to make a brand more sustainable. We don't have that. This is in every single person's role at Patagonia to make sure we do the right sort of things and the responsible things as a brand. And when this image dropped, uh, I think it was High Feast, and it went all around the internet. Um, and I got it sent from friends. I had to call some people in Ventura. It's like, hey, is this true? Did we, did we put this label in the shorts? Because this was just the product department who decided that our stand up shorts, those are shorts which we've been making since 1973, and we've been standing up against climate denial since 1973. And if on often, sort of shouts in the wrong way, huh? fuck the assholes out. <laughs> so they decided to put that label in the stand-up shorts. And that got picked up by media. So also our brand, and as much again as I love to claim it, we're not a marketing brand. We just tell the stories when we do the right sort of thing. Now what does it really mean for us as a brand? And you could really look at Patagonia twofold. On one side, we're the responsible business. You don't hear us say we're a sustainable brand. Unless you're a tomato, a sustainable product doesn't exist. Vegetables and fruit, yes, that grows, that can be sustainable. But the products we make all have an impact on the environment. So it's nonsense to say that there's such a thing as sustainable products. So the, the, you will, what you will hear us say is we are a responsible business. We try to be responsible and we try to do our best. Uh, and we are not perfect, but we're trying to improve constantly. So on one side, you will see us as a responsible business. This is all about our footprint. So let me take an example of a wetsuit. Well, the ocean there, are lots of people surf in it, and you wear a wetsuit. The water is cold, you don't go out in your shorts, because otherwise you don't hold longer than five minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. So we make wetsuits. And what most of the wetsuits are made from neoprene. And neoprene is a chemical. And I would really encourage you all, if you haven't, to look up the article The Guardian did around neoprene in the factory in the US. It's mind-blowing. This is not only bad for the planet, this is also really bad for people. So we realized we can't build wetsuits out of neoprene. So we work together with a small organization, which is called Ulex, and they make a fabric out of natural trees. And we started producing our wetsuits and make them out of natural trees. And now our full line is made out of, uh, out of Ulex, a natural rubber. <coughs> then the way these products are built is important as well. You won't think that, but every product we build, or we wear right now, is handwork. People touch these products. And often these products are made in Asia. And often these products are not made by people who who earn a fair and living wage. So we started working together with an organization called Fair Trade USA in making sure our products are fair trade certified. And we have pretty high standards to our factories, so that means we can't just go to another factory and be like, you know what, like let this factory make our product because you have to check. It's fair trade certified now. So we work together with the Fair Trade USA organization and we pay the audit and pay all the work and partner with them to make a factory uh, fair trade certified. So in the story of Ulex and wetsuits, about 80% of all wetsuits worldwide are produced in this one factory in Thailand. That doesn't mean all the wetsuits are the same, because we create the wetsuit we want, they sew it together for us. And we work to get that factory fair trade certified, and that means we pay one to 5% upcharge on every product, and that means that product is fair trade certified. That money goes into a big pot, and next to the fair trade organization making sure that all these uh, employees get a fair and living wage, that money can, can be divided in the way these, employees, uh, these workers want. It can go to childcare, 
that go to a kitchen, that can go straight into their pocket as well. So fair trade is a really important thing. And what is really interesting here is we as a company started that, but this actually enables every brand to become fair trade certified. So almost every wetsuit you see out there can become fair trade certified. All they have to do is pay a one to five percent upcharge. And one percent is basically a wetsuit, and five percent is like buoys or something like that. So that's not a huge ask to make sure that these products are built in a fair way and people are treated really well. So do ask the questions. If you wear a wetsuit, ask the question, why is not fair trade certified? And then we make new products. But one of the things we know is the most sustainable thing you can do is not buy a product. So you need to keep your product in play longer. If you use your product about eight to nine months longer, it's about a season, it already has 20 to 30% less impact on the environment. So what that means is we need to repair our stuff. We got into a system where we buy new and new and new. We need to repair. And for that reason, we go on the road. On the right for you guys, you see Martina, and on the left you see Elsie. Uh, and we go on the road with them, repairing our gear, but also repairing other brands. Because at the end of the day, it's not about our brands alone. We need to repair all these things. And for us, that's one a tool where we can actually keep product in use longer. But it's also an educational tool. And people go home, and it now becomes your badge of honor. We have these wear patches. And it's actually now a cool thing to have a repaired product. So that's the thing we're after. And that's the sort of stories we want to tell. And then again, it's not just about us. And this is a, a little surf campaign which we're dropping next week. We celebrate the other brands who come on board at Dulex as well, because this is not just us. The whole industry needs to come on board. So we actually shout out in our communication that brands like Oxfam, but also a brand like Finisterre, just down the road, are doing the right thing. And we thank them for doing the right thing as well. Then the activist, company, com the activist side of the company. That all started with this one guy in that town hall meeting asking or showing those products on the river was not declared dead. And this turned into what we call the activist company. Yes, and we love to rock with some feathers now and then and kick, kick a few uh, things down the road. But what we really focus on are four focus areas. Number one is thriving communities. If we're honest and we want to get through this, it can't just be us. It can't just be this small group of wealthy, often wise people who are saving the planet for the rest of us. We need to do this together. So we realize we need to create thriving communities and all work together. We call that also opening up the outdoors where we get more people involved and start talking to more people. And healthy, uh, healthy lands and waters is a very important thing as well. If you look in the US, public lands are often these very big national parks. Uh, that's what is protected. That's what we call wilderness. If you look in Europe, we often talk about a small gorge or like one small valley or one part of the river, which we call wilderness. It's crazy to think about that. And agricultural transformation, the way we build our food and the way we build our products, we need to transform there. And the last one is, is climate solutions. So you have your natural based solution, but also, for instance, energy. That is very live right now. We all struggle with energy right now. We're in the midst of an energy crisis. And the real question is, which direction are we going into? So let me dive a little bit deeper into these and how we tell those stories or what sort of stories we tell. So these are three films we've made and three little campaigns around it. On the left side, you see a film which is called They Them, which is a film about Noor. Um, and they are a non-binary climber, and it, it shows the struggle they have. But we go with this film to the communities, which are not originally part of who we are, and by that we open up the outdoors. The next film is closer to home for you all here. This is one of our ambassadors, MJ, and this film follows him on his attempt to, uh, to um, um, run the fastest known time on the River Thames. <coughs> and he succeeds there. But it doesn't only tell that story, it also follows him, or it also follows the black history on the River, the river Thames. And it tells that story because that's a really dark story. And also the way we activate that. It's not to our traditional community. But we try to be welcoming and, and really all come all together into this fight for the environmental crisis. 
And the last one, I should put it after film, which dropped last week. I would very much encourage you to watch them all. And um, that's a film about Molly. And Molly is an old advisor for the Obama administration. <coughs> um, and she struggles with mental health issues. But at the same time, she tries to go for the big alpinist um, route. And it follows her. Then, of course, regenerative organic. We started with organic cotton. But now we realize we need to go further and we focus on regenerative organic cotton. And we tell the stories there. Then energy transition. In 2001, when we launched this campaign around community energy, we did not know what was happening in energy. But now this campaign is more relevant than ever. We're in the midst of an energy crisis. And the real question is, do we go left to an old system which is dirty and old, outdated? Or do we go to a future which is renewable? And community energy is really one of those solutions where not these big companies create this energy, but it's ours. And it makes us more resilient as well for the future. That is a campaign and a story we told. And then last week, this dropped. It was one of those other moments again. <laughs> we were a B Corp, and we've been for quite a while. Patagonia was the first American company to become a B Corporation, and we've been part of creating the B Corp Corporation. And this was really Yvonne already looking at the future. And how can I make sure that this company, that the mission and the vision of this company never changes? And that started with the B Corp movement. But then last week, and I guess everybody saw it around the news as well, Yvonne decided to give his whole company away. <laughs> and they created two different trusts. And one trust really is set up to make sure that the vision and the mission of this brand doesn't change. And the other trust, is really focused on supporting all these different environmental organizations. So the brand itself and the way we operate doesn't change at all. We are still a for-profit business. We are not an NGO. We are a for-profit <coughs> business and we remain a for-profit business. And 1% of the sales for the one for the for-profit business goes to all these environmental groups. But then on top, the profits made by the organization will all go and it's expected to be about 100 million a year, will go to this one trust with the sole reason, with the sole purpose to, to save the home planet. So we can really say that our purpose right now and our only shareholder is the planet. So if we say we're in business to save the home planet, we can really say we're in business to save the home planet. And think about it. If you own a company which is worth about three billion, and you just give it away to the, to the environment. And this all started with this one guy who just wanted to serve and climb. He wasn't thinking like, oh, how can I save the planet? He ended up doing the right sort of thing. And that ended up being this. And do we ever get criticized? Hell yeah. <laughs> Haters are gonna hate. But also people criticize us. And that also helps us to, keep, to stay honest and true. So I want to show you a little video I saw last night of an interview our CEO Ryan did. Uh, and that just sort of shows what we're up against. In China, ramping up coal and everything else, when do you expect to see these efforts of your founder actually start to impact the weather, the bad weather that we see? I think that's your turn. I think it's a ridiculous question. It's all side shit, but all right. <laughs> But that's a ridiculous question the world gets right now. And like, it's, it's amazing to not only have Ryan or these junior designers or these other people in the company, but also a CEO like Ryan who just says, sorry, that's a ridiculous question. And I don't think I should answer that. I'll sidestep it. So really what this is about is we should not only tell our commercial tales. We do tell those stories. But we need to amplify the truth and the voices of others. Because the issues we face tomorrow are going to be drastically different than today. And I see everybody's like, what? This is already pretty bad. If we don't change our way, they're going to be drastically different. So here, this room of people, we are a group of creatives and storytellers. And it really is up to us to decide what sort of stories we tell. <coughs> so that's my story around Patagonia. And I would love to take questions if they're there. And we have five minutes for those. Are there any people who have a question? Yes. Hi. You told the story about.
about um, Yvonne getting the team on a bus and taking them out to the um, where the cotton was being chemically processed. And I think in a way that that really kind of answers my question. But it, for for those businesses who aren't at that stage where everyone that you hire knows exactly what the mission statement is and is on board themselves anyway, but for people who are hiring people who may not know as much about the environment or might not care as much that you need them to, how how do you suggest that you get them on board with with that passion? And That's a really good question. So the question really is, um, how do we get people on board who want to say align with the mission statement or don't understand it? And we have that as well. We get more and more people who want to be part of Patagonia. If you if you look around on the streets, you see a lot of people wearing our P6 logo t-shirts. And you can often ask yourself, like, does this person know what his logo is about? Uh, we even had Ted Cruz in the US wear one of our better sweaters. And he's a guy we don't like. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so what we really do is take people on a journey with us. Um, and I think what you really see is from ownership all the way down, everybody's invested in this mission statement and everybody's enabled to do that. And I and the company doesn't <coughs> believe that people don't want to do the right thing. So if you give them the opportunity to do the right thing, they will come with you. And that does mean, yes, we, uh, uh, people at Patagonia, they can go uh, on, a, on a paid uh, internship for, to different environmental organizations and learn there. It means we do loads of lunch stuff for employees. It means we, we have something we call Earth University, or the Crack Program, which educates our employees around the topics we care about. And people come in from different regions and different stages of environmentalism. So we need to educate them. And I think that's for every organization then, like, educate people. Like, I sometimes get frustrated if you run a campaign, and then I hear people in the open world, nobody knows about it. And I'm like, yes, people do. Have to check your social media. <laughs> um, but that's also like the other side of the story is like it's our job to do that. So like take people on that journey, I would say. Yes. How do you answer the question, because we get this all the time, that businesses shouldn't be political? Um, I think it's a ridiculous question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no uh, I, uh, the, the big question is, um, is the environment political? Because what we are doing and why we're doing certain things is because, first and foremost, we do things to um, save our rivers, save our wildlife, uh, save our wild spaces, or save the environment. So is that a political thing? It became a political thing where the left <coughs> or the right have a certain opinion. So if we all come on board, so if you look at that, that tag, that was exactly at the same time Trump was in that demonstration. Do we like Trump? Eh, we actually <laughs> sued him. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was not just about Trump. It's everybody who ignores or denies the climate. And that can be on the left or right. And I think what we really need to do is we need to take some people on board. We can't just be in our echo chamber. So sometimes we need to have conversations with people on what do you mean? Why is the climate political? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough question. but. I think that really is the answer. If we all, left or right, come together to save the planet, we're great. If it's only the left, does it become political or do we just care about the environment? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll precursor this by saying I, I love what you do and I'm a big fan of the brand. I have a question. Oh, sorry, there's one here, one there's one in the back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but I was just wondering, obviously you've grown a lot as a company over the last couple of decades, and even some of the campaigns you did, telling people not to buy stuff, enabled you to grow grow further. Um, I was just wondering whether there was any, ever, any conversations internally where you said, actually, we don't want to get any bigger, we don't want to sell more, we just want to stay a little bit kind of smaller uh, uh, to whether it was always about getting big, because obviously there's a bit of a kind of a contrast or a compromise as you get bigger. I, I think the, the, the answer is more is there's never a time when we don't have those conversations, because it's constantly part of, of those conversations. And um, like we all wear our products, um, so in an ideal world, we don't. It's not, it's not gonna happen, is it? Yeah. So if we, 
if we look at the brands people buy, one of the things we say that if people need a product, what is need, but if they need a product to, to go climb, and sometimes that is a product which actually is life or death, buy the responsible one, buy the right sort of product. So we constantly try to look back at like, where does our growth come from? And then challenge ourselves. So for instance, that PSIG logo I, 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 um, I talked about, um, we knew that a lot of people didn't know what the product exactly was, so we started putting stuff in the label, in the neck label, big, how it was built, and stuff like that. And if we can take people on that journey, yeah, we feel, we feel good about that. But we constantly ask ourselves how big should we and could we be. And we also sometimes have uh, minus growth numbers. Just because in certain regions we became too big and not too big. And if you really look at Europe, relatively we are still a small brand. In the US we're very big, but in Europe we're, we're relatively small. Um, and we've gone up and proudly says, and he can't say that anymore because he's not the owner anymore, but uh, he's never seen a billion dollar company he likes. So for him, and that's the stories I also get from the boardroom. Normally five minutes about revenue and targets and those sort of things, and then five hours about the impact we've had. So it just, and it's also, it's the dynamic which we will never, it's, it's the uncomfortable thing within the brand, I would say, a little bit, yeah. What do you feel good about? And maybe a good example as well is um, the way we build products is often very important. We build work, workwear, and that's made out of hemp. And then to the point where we launch that, there was a lot of demand for that. And we could not um, supply those products in the way we wanted to build them, which was organic hemp. So we just didn't deliver that. Uh, is that sometimes bad for the business? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. As we, as we grow, we want to grow with those. Yeah, that's, we're really close to close. So maybe one more question? Well, there was a lady just in the back as well. So we did that too? Yeah. We're gonna do two, okay, super fast. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I was particularly struck on the uh, the Facebook thing. So you uh, decided, right, we're not going to advertise on Facebook. What was the knock on effect of that for you as a business? Um, I, th I think as a business, one of the things we do um, on social media is get our brand out there. So we tell the stories we want to tell. So if you look at the viral campaigns or CSR campaigns, the way products are built. That's the sort of stories we, we want to get out, and that's where we would put money behind. But that, the challenge really was there. But if you also look at the brand we are right now, there's still there's a lot of organic growth and a lot of organic demand. And did it change the business? It, it, it didn't at all. But did it change the way we had to think within marketing? Completely, because all our ads was, were in the Facebook bucket, and we worked with different partners to figure out how a world beyond Facebook looked like. And now more and more brands come on board and don't want to be part of Facebook anymore. And we start to create an alliance there as well. And like for instance, one of the things on Twitter, in the US in a few states, you can actually, uh, what would you call it? Like um, uh, hate speech, you could say like, this is hate speech, where that can't happen in the rest of the world. And that's one of the things which is middle alliance where we now try to create legislative legislative change or policy change within social media platforms. So it's sort of a knock-on effect, and we often don't step back. We just keep going forward and see if more and more people and brands come on board. Last one. Uh, this is my question. Is, um, we kind of know that we need policy change and we know we need businesses to change, but we also believe that we need civil disobedience to do so. Has Patagonia or would Patagonia ever get involved in encouraging people to get off the sofa and, and into the streets? Uh, 100%. Uh, we have a bail policy for employees. So. If, if you go on the streets and strike and you get caught, like Patagonia bails you out. Uh, we also run different campaigns, like in 2018, if I'm right, or 2019, uh, in support of Fridays for Future, who, which is started by Greta Thunberg. She goes strike every Friday. More and more um, youth started striking as well. And at a certain point, we realized we also needed to put our power behind that. So we launched on uh, that September, just before that, a big campaign to encourage people to go out and strike. 
Last week was the big strike again. We encourage our employees to go out and strike. Uh, you get civil disobedience training if you work for Patagonia. So 100%, even our CEO uh, was locked into a chain from, uh, from XR in Amsterdam. So I think everybody has their own sort of part of the journey. So do we say you need to do civil disobedience? Absolutely not. Some people do something else, but do we mind it? No, we love it. 